I'm taking you on a journey about the anointing. Amen. Five important things I want you to know about the anointing. Number one, it is difficult to become anointed. Hallelujah. It is difficult to become anointed. You must understand that it's difficult. It's not easy. Listen. It's not easy to become a doctor. It's not easy to become a professional in anything. Even in the natural world. Just as it's difficult to become a doctor and even to become a specialized doctor. Hallelujah. It's difficult. Huh? Look. Many people think that it's not, how many, how many think I'm, do you think I'm struggling to preach now? Does it look easy? How, how many feel that it looks easy? Huh? I'm teaching, isn't it? And does, does it look easy? Do I look relaxed? Do I look like, I mean, I mean, this is something I can do for hours and hours, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very easy. I mean, it's like I don't even need to prepare. Now, this is the characteristic of difficult things. They look easy like golf there is no game as deceptive as golf when you see the people standing there and, they just seem to do <laughs> and then they seem the ball seems to go right to the place and they just put it in and yet golf is a very very difficult game very few people succeed in persisting at playing golf. Pastor Oliver tried to start and he ran away. <laughs> Something has to be determined within you to play the golf. Otherwise, you. Huh? It's through Kenny. You left. Ah, he never came for you. Okay. <laughs> Kenny, you are being blamed now. <laughs> You must be, it looks easy, 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 easy. But it is very difficult to ever get to that place. Huh? And that's how preaching is. That's how being a minister is. Laying hands on people, having a crusade, doing it, it looks easy. Sometimes you hear a pastor preach and he preached what he preached last time, he preaches it again. So you think to yourself, it must be so easy to just say the same thing again. I'm not struggling or anything like that, but it's difficult, it's difficult even maybe to get to the point where somebody will invite you to his church. It's a, I mean, it's a very long road to ever be invited to say anything. It's a very long road to be invited to another country. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then another long road is to be invited again. Do you understand? And it's a long road to write a book. And it's a long road for anybody to ever read your book. And it's a long thing to ever print more than a thousand or two thousand copies of your book. Because most people print a thousand copies, 500 copies, two thousand copies. And that's the end of printing. This has been, these books are, this are yet another print of the same book. And we have printed thousands. Now we are crossing the half a million mark. And soon, I believe, we will be crossing a million and be going into millions of books. I mean, it, it looks as simple and as easy as ABC. But it is not like that. Nothing. One day I, I was at a crusade. Benny Hinn came to Ghana. And he came to preach on the stage. As he preached. No, not while he was there. And I wasn't thinking in a mad way but I, I i realized and I, I i mean not that i wasn't it's not a good thing to think that's why i'm, I'm not um, saying that that's what i was thinking but i realized that i could preach better than he was preaching that day but i realized that even if i could preach 100 million times better to be the one behind that pulpit with 100,000 people all around. In fact, so many people that Pastor Kakra was in the crowd. He said at a point his legs were not touching the ground. Yeah. It was a very dangerous thing. His legs were not touching the ground. He was lifted up. The people all around. It was now, he was now just suspended, suspended in the air. The crowd was moving like this to the right and there. Thick crowd. 
In fact, so much so that at a point during the crusade, they thought that the stadium was going to collapse. So they had to stop the singing because it began to vibrate. That's the number of people that were at the Benihim. I mean, to get to the place where somebody will come, the number of people will come. And then you open the Bible and even sing, read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day, read your Bible, pray every day, if you want to grow. I mean, I'll give you just that sermon to preach or just that song to sing. To get to the point where this number of people will gather, ah, it's a very, very hard thing. Do you understand? So what you see the person doing there when he comes to sing a song, read your Bible, pray every day, or he comes to preach a sermon which you could preach better. Yeah, that one looks very easy and it's easy, but to get to that place, huh, that's why Elisha said, you ask for a hard thing. And you see, it's the anointing does all those things together and makes all those things possible. We can all sing Dalin Shek songs, but you cannot easily be Dalin Shek. Something and something and something puts it together to become Dalin Shek. Oh, yeah? What do you think? Some of you may be in the church, you think oh, you, you can preach better than Pastor Oliver. Okay, I agree with you, but you are not the one who can stand behind. It takes something to be put behind that sacred desk, something you don't have yet. What do you think? So me, I don't mind if I'm in my church and people can preach better than me. It, it's more than just that little event. What do you think? Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, it's very hard. It's a long road. So the next thing that you must know about the anointing is that you must have a strong desire for the anointing. Do you understand? You must have a strong desire. Because it's hard, you must have a strong desire. Like, for instance, I play golf. You understand? And I have a strong desire to play golf and to play golf well. That is the only reason why I am doing something as difficult as golf. It looks very easy. And I say that it's very deceptive. And one of the reasons why I play golf is for health reasons. You understand? I have, I have health good enough health reasons to play. And I, I also know that it's something that is one of the few exercises within my life, the way my life is that I can pe pe continue. And I need to, to do. My father died of heart disease and he died of other things and so on, which need whatever. And as you grow old, sometimes the things that killed your father, your daddy's devil starts to come to you. Zigzag. <laughs> yeah. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So, I have more than one reason why I will play, apart from that it's also enjoyable at a point and it's also relaxed, which we need, etc., etc. And I know that I cannot go and be jumping up and down in a gym. I don't see why I'm, 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 I'm not, uh, what do you call it? It looks like punishment to me. Pardon? Yourself in the gym, yeah. As Oliver is very disciplined. He goes to the gym. <laughs> so, if you are not determined, do you see? And also another reason why I play golf, it gives me fellowship. You will never interact with certain people unless you play golf. Oh yeah. When Yogicho came to Ghana, the only thing that he did outside preaching was to play golf. And I, here was I, walking on a golf course with Yonggi Cho. In fact, driving to the golf course with him in my car. I drove him. Oh, it's an honor. It's a privilege. And in other places, I've been with other men of God, playing golf with them. Because they play golf, and that's where you even get a chance to be with them. I was with Bishop Blake in Los Angeles. We played golf together the whole day. Different groups and different people you fellowship. So I have more reasons that I have a strong desire. It's healthy, you get it? Fellowship relaxes you. And you, you see, people sell banks at the golf course. You walk and then I, oh, I've sold my bank to you. Yeah, they make deals, different things. Fellowship, especially. So I have many reasons. So that's why, even though it's hard, 
You get it? I have a strong desire and it, it makes me close and have fellowship with whoever plays with me. So I have more reasons. You get it? So if, if you are here and you don't have any strong reason why you want to be anointed, I can promise you now that you will not be anointed. Uh, if it's just some goosebumps that you want to have, just for goosebumps, we can have more goosebumps. I can have a goosebump session immediately after I finish preaching. You understand? We have lots of available goosebumps. But I'm talking about becoming an anointed person. Do you understand? I mean, there must be some reason. Either maybe you really love God or you really want to do the ministry or you really want to be fruitful or you really want to move forward with God. I mean, some driving force to let you search for anointing. If you do not have some very strong reason, it's too difficult to get. <laughs> Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. Sometimes I see people who want to study medicine and I tell them, look, if you do not have a very strong reason, maybe you really like whatever and so on, it's very difficult and very hard. So you must have a very good reason to do it. Before you go along and go through the medical course. Do you understand? Yeah. Like for instance, when I finished school, I mean I, I finished, I went to medical school because that was the school that I, I passed and I, I went and I qualified. So I was there. I didn't really want to be a doctor or anything, but that was, I was, it was, the, I was one of the best and so I was taken to the school. That was the best, the top people go to, to that school. So when I even went for the interview, they asked me, why do you want to study medicine? Why do you want to be a doctor? I said, oh, I, I, I didn't know what to say. I said, I want to heal people. <laughs> That's what I said. And then suddenly the interview turned into a discussion about church. I was lucky that I was one of the top 10 people because the first 10 in the interview were automatically taken. But my discussion was not intelligent. It was, I didn't have any reason. I didn't want to be a doctor. I just had passed. So as I was in the, in the school, by the time I finished, to now start again another seven years to become a surgeon, a neurosurgeon, a cardiothoracic surgeon, or whatever surgeon, brother, the, the strong desire and a reason for that thing was not there. So I look, I said, this I know, I cannot go there. And I didn't go. I ended. Because I don't, to, to, you, you will suffer. You go through a lot, years and years doing donkey work. Donkey work, you just assist, you just watch, you just go to the world, you go, you come, you go, you come, hours late, hours late. Something, what am I going to get from it? I don't see what I will get from it. I don't want it. It's not of interest to me. I want to be in the ministry. I want to serve God. So I switch my specialization to God. You understand what I'm saying? But now my strong desire, now I knew by that time, I was 25 years old, by that time I now knew what I really wanted. So I started to go with the zeal and strength towards something else. That's what I gave myself to. I had to finish the school because I already started. And I finished. And one year after practicing and finishing my household, that was the end. Not a day more in any clinic or hospital. Not a day. It was over. I began to follow my real career and my real calling. Hallelujah. May you follow that calling of God when God has put in your heart a desire for him, a desire for his work, a desire for his anointing. May you follow that anointing. May you live for that anointing. May God raise you up and give you the strength and determination that is needed. You need determination. You need determination to go through and become anointed. Because a long road, you'll be insulted. You'll be hurt. You'll be offended. You have to work hard. You'll be nothing. There are many ways you can become anointed. I remember one day, a man of God was about to die. And I didn't know he was going to die. But he was about to die. He, he died two weeks later. His name was... Idahosa. Idahosa. How many have heard of the Archbishop Idahosa? Very famous, great man of God who did many, many great things. Two weeks before he died suddenly and unexpectedly, he came to Ghana. When he came to Ghana, he came to have a program in Bishop Duncan Williams' church. 
and um, also he had a church, two other people. There was a lady who used to be a secretary to him who had also started a big church, and then there's another church called Redemption Hour, which was the name of his churches in Ghana. So he came and he had a program at Bishop Duncan Williams' place. Then he was going to this lady's church on Monday, and then he was dedicating this other guy's church on Tuesday or Monday or Tuesday, whatever. So, because I had a good relationship with Bishop Nick, I added myself to the convoy. You understand? Because I, 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 I didn't know him. I admired him. I liked him and I had been with him. He came to do the sword cutting for Bishop Duncan Williams Church build, building. I talked with him there and I've met him different times. I knew him. I mean, I actually knew him, but not so closely. But, you know. So, I told Bishop Nick, you know, I would like the Archbishop to come to my church, even though it's not on his program. So, on the morning, he said, come, you come around, we'll see what can happen. So, on the morning, when he came, after he finished this morning service, we're going into the car, and there I was. Then he said to me, get in the car. So now, I was in the car. I was in the car. Archbishop was there, Bishop Nick, with the three of us and the driver. And he said, go to Lighthouse. So instead of going where they were going, they were on their way to our church. Now, when he got to our church, he came and looked at the building, one of the buildings. He said, wow, this is wonderful. And he came to the other building, the cathedral. When we got into the cathedral, he said, kneel down. I knelt down on the stage and he called his assistant, bring me oil. And he laid hands on me and poured oil on me right there. When the oil touched my head, I tell you it was like fire was burning me. Now, I honestly thought they had poured some chemical <laughs> that dissolves the skin or does dissolve the hair or something. And he laid hands on me and prayed for me. I was one of the few people that he prayed for. And then we went away. Now, I believe that God blessed me. But I think this is either before or after. No, I think this is after this. The Lord spoke to me in my heart and said to me, go and sow a seed in this man's life. You see, because there are things that are spiritual transactions. I, 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 I feel that it's a spiritual transaction. For it to be complete, you also have to sow a seed because it's in the Bible where it says, let him that teacheth, huh? let him that is taught, communicate to him that teacheth in all good things. I, I don't really have whatever, but one of the things that God speaks to me about is to give money to people who have ministered to me. It happened to me enough times. God has spoken to me, give money to this person, give money to this person. And I do. And it's, it's not small amounts of money. But it is something that I feel is a spiritual transaction. Anyway, so I felt in my heart, go and give this amount of dollars to this man. So I got the money, I put it in my pocket, and I went to church. He was preaching. This was his last meeting, morning, Bishop Nick's church. And I was sitting on stage. I don't know what came over him. I don't know whether he was angry with me or what, the archbishop. When he was preaching, you know something like how I use an example? He called uh, the pastor Okay, come, let me show you. He called me, he said, you, come. Then he called me, then he hit me, hit me, come, down, down, like that. He pushed me down, you know, and I was wearing my bishop's shirt and what I, all the pastors, then he put me down, he hit me, and I said, come down, come down. You know, and that's why I didn't even call Craig to do it. I wanted to do it on Pastor Richard. <laughs> come down. And, you know, it was quite humiliating. Then he said, okay, go back to your seat. He was giving an illustration, then went back, go back. You see, then he came back to me. He, he came to me again. Then he held my head again. Then he did some, you know, and even Bishop Nick looked at me 
and he, he could feel whatever because it was it was something there was something about it and I had his seed in my pocket you know what I, I was going to give to him <laughs> Are you understanding what I'm talking about? <laughs> because I, I, in a sense, I was about to complete a spiritual transaction and now the enemy was offending, was bringing an offense. I was, in fact, not, it's not just what I was, but anybody who was there would find it. It was really funny. It was odd. And even the way he held my head and put it down. <laughs> but I thought about it. I thought about it. This man, what is this? What, what is this? In fact, I felt that he didn't even he didn't like me. I, I mean, I don't know what I had a bad, I had a feeling. But I see, that's the devil. Anyway, I decided that Satan, you will not detract me from what I have decided to do. So I I found out where does this man stay? Where is his hotel? And I found the hotel. So I drove alone to the hotel. When I got there, I said, I, I want to see the Archbishop in the house. So they called him and said, so and so is here. I said, let him come up. When I got into his room, I sat with him. There was another person there. The person went. Then I took her and I said, I, I felt that God wants me to bring this to bless you and to say thank you and to sow a seed in your life. He looked at the seed. I mean, he looked at it and he was touched. You know, then he held my hand and he prayed for me. Later on, he told Bishop Nick, he said, watch that guy. He's going to do well. I was at home two weeks later when Bishop Nick called me and said, the Archbishop has just died. I was so glad that I had done what I wanted to do. And I finished. And I, I tell you, God uses different people to bless you. And to do what he wants to do. Later on, they will come around for funeral contribution. I said, well, I've made my contribution already. It. But it's a long road to become anointed and to have different gifts. And there's offense on the way. There are hurts on the way. There are things to drive you out, drive you to the side, offend you, show you. Oh, man. If you don't have a heart to carry on, you are not going to be anointed. You know my best videos of Benny Hinn, the ones when he used to come to Ray McCauley's church, I have all of them at home. That's what I play. When he was skinny and very little, even before he got married, you should see him running up and down like that. He used to preach the same. In fact, the message he preached in Ghana when he came, what I said, he wasn't preaching a good message. I'm not that I wasn't a good man, but I thought I could preach better. He preached that same thing in uh, at Rebet's church, at, at Rebet's camp meeting. They were, they were meeting in a tent. And I was surprised about how, oh, more than 20 years ago, this person has been doing this, laying hands on people, praying for the sick, anointing people, doing all sorts, years and years and years and years and years and years before. Look, you should be interested in the man of God's older things. That is where, when you see people at a certain station, you don't know how they came to be where they are. That's what you should be, not where he is now. Because you are now starting where he was 24 years ago. It's going to go up. And that's what you should be interested about. It's hard. It's long. But if you have a strong desire and determination, you will, by all means, because become an because God will never be wicked enough to tell you to desire something you can never have. Never. It cannot happen. He said in his word, desire earnestly the best gifts. The best gifts are available for you. That's why me, I am praying for, to see Jesus, and I believe that I will see him. I believe I will see him really in a chair like that, that I will sit with him and discuss something with him. I have a lot of things to discuss with him. <laughs> It's the best gift. It's the highest kind of gift where you have a vision where the person is like a real... I pray for it all the time. I pray for it. I believe it. I ask for it. I want it. I want to go to heaven before I go. 
I want to see angels and all these things. These are what I'm praying for. Those are what I ask for. If you love me, you pray for me. Pray that this thing will happen. And when it happens, I'll, you know, I will come and tell you. <laughs> How many would like to, to hear about it? So what the Lord told me and so on. Yeah. <laughs> so, desire the best gifts. Don't go for something, Lord. You, you see, you can look at a man of God and say, you see, what is on this man? I want it. Yeah, that's what Elijah says. I want your anointing times two. And that's how I became anointed. I look at something and say, what this person has, I want that thing. <laughs> you can have it. You can have it. And I'm going to show you how to get it. How many want to know how to get it? Do you have any of that book, Catch the Anointing here? Can I have one? Yeah. This is another little book. It's called Catch the Anointing. It's, it's more elaborate in this one, but there's also some things that are here. In fact, there are many things that are in this one that are not here. So I'm actually preaching from the two. Catch the Anointing. Get a copy. Do we have enough to give to everybody? One we don't have. Okay. So we'll choose. It's in the pastor's pack. Okay. Catch the Anointing. Make sure you get a copy. Amen. Oh, what a desire. Amen. The next thing that I want you to know about the anointing is that Jacob, amen, desired the anointing. And that is why he became anointed and Esau was left behind. Every of all the people here, there are some who will desire so much to be gifted and anointed that God will like you. You know, Esau was the correct place. You see, and you see, some of us, we are so moral, righteous, good. We don't do bad things. But you don't want the anointing. You understand what I'm saying? You are moral, you are nice, you are good, you are correct. I mean, you are the perfect type. You are the virgin, you are the whatever, you are the, you know, holy one. You, you get it? You are not like Jacob. Jacob was the thief and the liar. But he desired the gift. And he said, uh, and as for Esau, he said, what is the use of this anointing when I'm a hungry man? What is the use of this anointing when I'm hungry? What is the use of maybe going to Ghana or going somewhere for a conference or going somewhere to receive the anointing when I don't have money? What is the use? Many years ago, look, I was in London. I was, I was there as a student. And uh, I didn't have much money. But all the money I had, I used to buy a Dick's Bible. I, it cost me 63 pounds. Then, I used, I ordered, there were, they, and those days, Dick's Bibles were not available. I don't see many Dick's Bibles here. You see, you must get a Dick's Bible. Yes, it's expensive. You see, that is it. It's expensive. The anointing is difficult to get. Very hard. It's only for those who who, I, I used, I didn't buy anything. Nothing. Not a shirt, shoes, not, just the Bible. Today, I can buy even a shop if I want to buy the whole shop. I can buy a shop of shoes if I want to buy a shop of shoes. I can buy suitcases filled with shirts if that's what I really want. Through that one thing, everything has been made available to me. Choose the right thing. Esau said, I'm hungry. What is the use of this to me when I am hungry? You are talking like an idiot. I can't have any lower word for you. And I didn't mention your name, so don't get angry, but it's you that I'm talking about. <laughs> you are foolish. Capital F. Fool. Choose the right thing, sister. Don't choose a handsome man. Choose an anointed man. Amen. You wouldn't even notice his, his, whether he's handsome or not when you are married. It's true. How the wives co complain, the, your husbands don't say you're looking nice and like your dress. They go out and somebody else says you're looking nice, your dress is nice, you look nice, baby, and so on. Somebody else says it. Because when you get married, they wouldn't even see you. They pass by you. You'll be naked. They pass by you as if you are the wardrobe. They don't even see you. 
Zimbo. Zigzag. <laughs> the next point God anoints the desirous. God anoints people who are desirous. God will pass over a thousand, let me read it. God will pass over a thousand people who don't care much for their anointing and give it to the person who strongly desires it. He will pass over 1,000 people and give to the person who desires it. He will put it in his hand. Do you desire to be anointed? Bible says that Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to seven, go up now. And he looked and he went up and he said, go seven times. Why did this particular servant not receive the anointing there and the servant who was with Elijah at the beginning? This is not the guy who became anointed. Do you understand? Elijah had two servants, Gehazi. Elijah had two servants, Elisha and then the first servant. The one whom he sent when he prayed for rain, go up and down seven times. That was the first servant of Elijah. But this guy did not stay to the end. He, 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 when there was trouble with Jezebel, he left. So God will pass by a thousand people who don't care much. The slightest difficulty, they drop it. That is why even though I could give everybody here all my books free of charge, I will not do that because you don't really desire that not because many of us will spend a thousand runs on something is that not so 500 runs you go into the shop then you come by the book and you look at it and say how much is it oh it's expensive expensive then you don't deserve to have it because it costs a lot to become anointed you ladies look at the things you have you have a thousand dresses you can't even find your things I said, you can't even find your things. And yet you're going to buy more things. And yet you go and you look at a book and you say, how much is it? 100 rands. Meanwhile, you go to a shop and you buy things. 500 rands. You buy a pair of shoes. 1,000 rands. You buy this. You buy that. And so on. But you come and you have to spend 100 rands on a book. You look at it up and down and say, it's not worth it. And therefore, you will not be anointed. God will pass over 1,000 people who don't desire the anointing. And go to just one person who desires the anointing and put it in his hand. Desire spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1. Desire. You have to desire the anointing. I can't overemphasize that. Amen. And then the last point is, you, you can desire somebody else's anointing. Amen. You can look at somebody and say, this, I want this. And God will give it to you. Amen. Stand to your feet. I'm taking you slowly through... The becoming anointed. Amen. How many are being blessed with the anointing? Lift your hands to the Lord and just ask the Lord, Lord, touch my life, Lord. I want to be anointed. Where's the organist? I need musicians all the time. You know, and the musicians, you should be at this meeting. I shouldn't be begging you to be. Are they not full time people? It should be here all the time. So what we are teaching now, if you are not here, you, you, your mind will be different. You see, Judas and Thomas, their problem was they were not at some of the meetings. Amen. Can I have an amen? amen? Judas was always doing something financial, something. He was going up and down and so on. That made him different. Thomas also, when Jesus appeared, he wasn't there. Where was he? Where everybody was there? So Judas and Thomas, they are names we don't easily give to our children. Thomas and Judas. In fact, I have never met somebody called Judas before. That his father baptized him and called him Judas. <laughs> Judas Thompson or Judas Mills. No. And Thomas too is more, is, uh, you see a few Thomases, but not so many. May you never be a Judas and a Thomas. Oh, I said may you never be a Judas and a Thomas. Where is the organist when I'm preaching about the anointing? Musicians are supposed to be, no, let me preach to them even though they're not here. Musicians are supposed to be anointed. In the Bible, pastors were the singers. 
Amen. Levites were those who played instruments, not session men and bandsmen who go and play in the world and come. That is why in our churches you hear songs, baby, hi, hello, one you touch you, see you there, over there, one day, hallelujah, Jesus. And then they say it's a Christian song. And you can't hear a single thing of what they are singing. <laughs> I don't enjoy such music. I enjoy music that I can understand clearly as a Christian song. Not something that anybody else... Where well, are the other musicians? There are more of you. Amen. There are more of you. We need, we need people to be in the church. We're having a shepherd's come. Everybody who works here must be here to listen to the word. What we are doing is very important. We are, I'm going to talk to you now about catching the spirit or the culture of the ministry. And if you are not here, you will be a Thomas, you will be a Judas. When Pastor Oliver calls for a meeting, you will be a funny person who cannot easily come. Every time you are late, you are not around, you are coming at a different time. It is a wrong behavior. Uh, lower, lower your volume, I'm preaching. Are you listening to me? Now, if we are going to have a big church, we need to be disciplined. When they say, come, everybody is coming. You know, somebody is having breakfast, somebody is having sex in his house, and we are preaching the word of God here. <laughs> Maybe some of these people are having sex right now as I'm, I'm preaching. <laughs> Not that they are fornicating, though. They are having sex with their wives or their husbands. When I'm preaching. And they won't buy the tapes too. They will make the CDs and they won't buy. Videos they won't buy. Then when they buy too, they won't listen to them. Huh? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Sometimes when you work in the church, you can become familiar with the church and familiar with the anointing. In fact, full-time staff are the most prone to backslide in the church. They are the greatest backslider. In my office, I realized that those who were full-time were backsliding. Because they are so busy doing this, doing that. Doing, that's what Judas did. So now I have started morning and evening sacrifice in the full-time office. When they come, they pray, they do whatever spiritual thing. And then the evening, they also have evening sacrifice. Because they are becoming too carnal, too worldly. You feel you are doing things in the church, so you are in the church. It's dangerous. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to the Lord. Lord, fill me. Lord, anoint me. Lord, touch me. Touch me. Just speak to the Lord. Speak to the Lord. Just pray to the Lord in a moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You may be seated. How many feel you are becoming anointed? Wonderful. I believe it. How many are enjoying hearing about the anointing? I'm enjoying it myself. Amen.